Good evening, Hi. everyone, and welcome to the November meeting of the Teaching and Learning Committee. We have uh, some people in our audience tonight, and that always makes us feel good, because it means you have input, and we, and we have lots of things to learn from you. So, was the meeting posted? Yes. Okay, thank you. Are there any citizens that would like to address the board this evening? Okay, hearing none, then we'll move on. Could we please have an approval of minutes from the o October meeting? I move approval. Okay, is there a second? Okay, it's moved and seconded to um, accept and approve the minutes as presented. Okay, um, we have no bright lights tonight. We gotta, we and we gotta vote on that. Do oh, okay. Duh. Right. All those in favor of accepting the minutes? Aye. Am I saying aye? Opposed? Thank you. Oh, thank God. Okay. Again, we have no bright lights, no presentation items. We have two action items, two information items, and one discussion item. Our first action item is approval of the AP dual language seminar course. Jody, will you take us into that, please? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Madam President, I'm gonna introduce, uh, looks like Dee Garcia's coming up flying solo this evening, but this, just to recap, uh, this came to you last month as an information item, mm -hmm. and so um, hopefully we're just solidifying approval for uh, this course uh, beginning next school year. So Dee's just gonna take, uh, take you through just a few final touches and uh, seek your approval this evening. Okay, thanks Jody, welcome. Awesome. Hi, thanks everyone for having us. Um, we do have several colleagues behind behind the, the effort to create this course. However, they are not here this evening, um, apologetically. So I wanted to walk you through a little bit the um, Appendix B, which is the um, universal design or lesson syllabus for the um, AP dual language seminar class. Um, I'd like to start out first if there are any questions. If not, I'll just walk you through stage one. We'll go one. ahead and walk us through and then okay, we can great. ask questions after. Perfect. Thank you. So as we discussed last time in stage one, the course description, this is an It's a class that is centered around um, the philosophy of engaged inquiry. So students will be um, engaging in questioning and exploring, understanding and analyzing, evaluating multiple perspectives, synthesizing ideas and teaming, transforming, and transmitting. One of the biggest um, ideas that we have in this course is that students will be transferring their learning between Spanish and English. Um, this is a course that is traditionally offered by the AP College Board only in English, and it's only assessed in English. Um, this course is uniquely different in which um, our dual language scholars will be learning in both Spanish and English. Um, we will emphasize the same biliteracy instructional practices that we do at the elementary school, which encourages a concept that we call metalinguistic awareness, which is the awareness of and how language works and how they interact together to, um, to study through the course material. You can see in the stage one, there are several enduring understandings, some of which include um, students will understand the impact of their own individual curiosity um, they'll strengthen their ideas around a concept that really speaks to them. They will use investigative processes in the, invest in the inquiry cycle to be able to um, examine, I think, deep questions that we have, um, including their methods. Um, they will choose and shape arguments, including finding relevant evidence to adjust claims, counter claims, and support claims. Um, and then they'll also understand about biases and perspectives. So this is really in its essence a research-based course. You can see on the page three you have of your handout, there is targets. We have six um, instructional targets that we will be measuring. I do think that that is um, lofty, but the teachers felt adamant that this was um, a class that requires a robust set of um, learning targets. So the first is that they identify a researchable question of multilingual and global or multicultural significance in both Spanish and English. Um, they'll conduct an independent and collaborative research to develop an argument in Spanish and English. They'll independently analyze and evaluate information in order to craft and communicate an evidence-based argument. Um, they'll present and defend research findings in written argument, oral defense, and through multimedia in Spanish and English. Participate effectively in creating a culture of learning in a multilingual, multicultural context again in Spanish and English, and then conduct insightful reflections that explain the initial views of a problem and the approach used to conduct research and solve the problem. As you can see from all of these endeavors, um, 
this type of scholarly work requires not only the highest levels of cognition, but the fact that we have scholars that can do this between and in and through two languages is what makes this course very unique. Um, this will be a course that if we're able to achieve um, recognition from College Board next fall, when we submit the syllabus, will be the first of its kind in the country that will be offered in two languages. Um, we hope to partner with a few other school districts across the country to be able to make this um, a reality for our students. So you can see following are the standards that are related to the course. And then I think on page six, I'm sorry I didn't number the pages for you. About page six or page seven on the very bottom of the page begins the student learning continuum. Where on the left hand side we have each of our, our targets that we want to assess and we have um, basic and proficient and advanced criteria for students as they're working through the class. So this is a class that can be taken um, for weighted credit if a student chooses to take the AP exam or can be taken for the benefit and the experience of taking the class. And we certainly think that some of our kids will take the AP exam and maybe many others won't take the AP exam. Um, we'll see how that kind of rolls out the first year. Um, with any respect, the work in the classroom is the same caliber of work that we would have for students that were preparing to take the exam. So we're preparing all students for that. I'll give you a minute to look through that continuum. Okay. As we move into stage two, if that's okay, or would you like to take questions on stage one? No? Okay, we'll move into stage two. Um, stage two is how we're going to determine the success of our students in this course. Um, the teachers that um, created this um, course outline decided that they would like formative class participation to represent 10% of the student's grade, and they do have a collaboration rubric. The collaboration rubric is not enclosed in your materials, but I can certainly share that with you. Um, it includes creating um, what I would call an environment, a cultural environment of excellence and an, ex uh, an environment of learning or culture of learning, um, which it requires students to engage when and engage with. It's really focused on like the pro-social skills that students need in order to be able to solve problems in a collective group of different individuals. Um, they will have formative coursework, and as we mentioned last month, this is aligned to the AVID um, practices. So you'll see some of them including Cornell notes, um, you'll see Socratic seminars, philosophical chairs, and a lot of the practices that the buildings in general are supporting across the curriculum. Um, the formative coursework, too, is preparatory for a student's performance on the AP Task 1, which comes up on or around like late November. Um, the teacher will be assessing the AP Task 1 and submitting her assessment of student progress. They won't be sending anything into College Board to be assessed. So the teacher does that in internally. Um, the summative course assessments include the semester one and semester two um, pieces, which are an individual research paper, a multimedia presentation, and defense. Our idea around this is that the research paper will be written in English, but the oral defense will be in Spanish. Um, we know that the oral language pieces are going to support the literacy pieces, so they're mutually required to be able to produce both. And that's our thought about that. 50% of the, um, the grade for the class will be dependent upon the AP Seminar Task 1 and Task 2 semester assessments. And those, again, are aligned in preparatory and artifacts towards the performance assessment submitted to AP College Board. Okay. Um, they will have lots of opportunities for oral defense, for mock defenses, lots of preparation and practice. Typically, um, the, the students do a lot of heavy lifting. There's a lot of teaching going on, skill-based teaching, research-based, inquiry-based teaching through the first semester. And then right around February, students receive the AP College Board packet of preparation materials. And their preparation materials are the things that they are using to be able to prepare for their final defense. So the course takes a very different look in its second semester and becomes much more student-driven, where the teacher becomes um, more of the collaborator and the facilitator and less of the actual leader. <coughs> So lots of small group instruction and even flexible instruction where students might not actually need to report to class, but maybe report to a, a place where they're going to have a study group or things like that. And in that way, it really replicates the, I think, the university experience for students. You can see that the um, summative tasks um, aligned to what the College Board is asking are outlined on the page following. Um, 
The individual research papers are up to 1,200 words, so quite lengthy essays, in a multimedia presentation in defense, eight to 10 minutes. Um, there are College Board rubrics that are associated with all of those, and they've been linked into this document. Um, the final task, which is the summative task two, um, requires a 200, or I'm sorry, 2,000 written argument, 2,000 word written argument, a multimedia presentation of six to eight minutes um, that we are thinking is going to be in Spanish, and then an oral defense. The oral defense is a unique part um, of this process because it requires our staff to formulate two questions that the students will be um, answering in defense of their, of their learning. Um, the stage three is kind of an outline of what we're thinking we may do. Um, the teachers who will be teaching this course have not been trained through AP College Board yet and have a lot of questions around that. We feel like we can't really create a curriculum map until they have received training. The AP College Board is very likely in their usual fashion to provide like almost a week by week plan of the types of lessons that need to be um, conducted. What they won't do in a course like this is provide any leadership or guidance around um, the resource, resources or materials that are going to go into the class. So all of that needs to be um, created or, yeah, I guess created and um, coordinated between the teachers and Maria Barreras, the world language and dual language coordinator. So that's what we have for the course. Um, the part which you may not be seeing is that we do have some texts in mind that we'd like to yeah. use. Um, but until we have the training, we're not going to be able to tell you definitively what we're thinking. We're thinking that what we'll have to do is come back to you and give you an idea of what might work for us. One of those texts was written by Dr. Kim Patowski. She's out of the University of Illinois, Chicago, and she is a nationally recognized um, researcher on dual language education. And her book is called Spanish in the United States. And it's all about um, the research and the context of two languages in contact with each other and two, lang and two cultures in contact. So she has a, a great book with a variety of research-based essays and vignettes of um, text that students are going to need to be able to practice their research and inquiry-based skills. Um, Jill Wickham has been a partner. She's the library media specialist for the school district of Waukesha, and she has um, investigated about six databases that will allow us to get access to peer-reviewed research in Spanish that our students are going to need for this course. So all of those things are still under significant review and we're hesitant to put our, our money on anything or bring anything to you until we know more of the flavor of this course and obviously get our teachers trained. So with that, I'd like to open up questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dee. Sure. Yes, I know Ms. Ryan Chuck had a question before. She answered it already. Pardon me? She answered she it. She answered it, Thank okay. You. Mr. Baumgart. Yes. Uh There's a lot here, uh, and I appreciate it. It's very, very positive. As I was going, looking over the uh, executive sum, <coughs> excuse me, the executive summary, a couple of things crossed my mind. This is basically going to re replace the need for youth options. It will replace the need for youth options at the 11th grade level. It will not completely replace the need for youth options. Currently, we have students in youth options at the 11th and the 12th grade because we do not offer any courses for them in Spanish language arts. Um, and that, that's really my, where my point was. Yep. Then, how many people are we talking about? Um, right now, we have, I'd say, about 75 students that are enrolled in what we have is AP Spanish 6, which is literature. Those same students are 10th grade students this year. They will be going to 11th grade next year, and they are the students that need this course. So, this is a substantial also uh, benefit to, to us in terms of the money that would not go to a college or someplace else for this because you'll be able to do it yourself. I was just concerned, I mean, if you have 75 kids versus eight or nine kids, that's a big difference. Well, we have 75 kids now. We will have 120 kids in okay, a few so short this, years. So these are all of our dual language kids. Population coming here. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dee. That's what I was looking yep. for. Okay. Oh, yes, Mr. Dietz. Dee, is this course going to be offered at... North and South High School. Okay, I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. which high schools? We don't yet have the population of students to warrant offering it at West High School. Um, we haven't yet crossed the bridge on if we have students that would like to access this course, how they'll access it. But we have had a generous commitment from the school district to transport kids from West to South so that they do get access to these courses. Um, 
Part of the grand scheme of all of this, of course, is ensuring that our dual language learners get the opportunity for the greatest amount of academic success in our schools. Um, and national research would suggest that having an articulated kindergarten to 12th grade program is the greatest opportunity for that to happen. So we can already see it with our freshmen and our sophomores who have taken this the two AP courses that precede it and hope that it will just continue to build their own sense of worth and um, with courses at value, what they can do. Did you say that there's no um, courses for students in 11th and 12th grade? Yes, ma'am. Wow. So, and the reality is, is very few of our students can work out the logistics of getting themselves onto the Carroll, um, UW Waukesha, or WCTC campus. Okay. Um, so it's quite a challenge for a lot of kids. We have, I think, about eight kids who are in youth options this year, and one of them is completing the entire course for medical translation and interpretation. Um, but that would not be an opportunity that's available to every child due to the transportation, other credits that they need, et cetera. So this is a really unique opportunity to bring it home to us. Wow. Um. Where is the training going to take place? Here? Are the people going to come here? Or no, I'm not sure. Usually um, for AP College Board training, we have to go out of the district for okay. that. Um, I'm okay. not sure if they're going to offer that here in the state of Wisconsin or as close as Illinois. We don't yet have dates. Who developed this? Did, did the team of people that are listed as preparing this, are they the people that developed this? Or is there a, um, a plan that's already in place well, there are AP seminar classes that are happening around the country. Um, they are happening in English, so when you see things that are contextual to our district, it's because our teachers developed it. For example, the learner continuum is ours. We developed that. The targets are ours, all of that. But some of the, um, the standards come from previous syllabi on this exact same course. Some of the big ideas and enduring understandings on the first page, too, are borrowed from other mm -hmm. syllabi because College Board is very consistent. You can get other people's syllabi and they will say the sure. same things. So, so does the College Board have to approve what we have here in order to um, give the credit? Yes, in fact, um, we will have to create a completely separate syllabi, not this one, to submit to them. Really? And that will be due um, sometime in 2018. But we are looking for um, this to start next fall. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And let's say there's some students from West that would be interested. I, I'm assuming they could come, but they have to travel, right? Um, yes, that's true. But at this point, we are providing um, transportation for students to go from West over to South to be Wonderful. able to take AP Spanish literature. Um, just the potential of our students to see themselves at this level of scholarship is so phenomenal. So I'm really grateful to have the support to be able to bring those kids. And you met one of the students recently, Carlos Arechiga, a young man that has been in front of the board a couple times. He's a student that makes that trip. It appears to me that um, the purpose of the course or the basis of the course is pretty much emphasizing research, uh, anal analysis, and um, in inquiry. Is that correct? Yes, and the ability to form a claim around an argument and support it and defend it, as well as understand counter positions, is really critical to this course. So yes, it's all about the research process, but it's also about being able to do investigation that understands both your point of view and others' point of views. Okay. Do we, I'm assuming we have a, a teacher that will be able to teach this course, correct? We have three teachers. Wow. We may have more than that. I would say that we have five teachers that could wow. teach this course. <laughs> But we have three teachers that collaborated to create this for you and are committed to making this happen. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's just great. Well, this is, according to my value system, very high-level course. Mm -hmm. A lot of skills. A lot of um, kids have to have skills in order to you know, be successful in this class. But they're also going to gain many more skills by participating. So, Absolutely. Definitely. I mean, to me, it's, a, it's like a college course as it's intended to be. So then they will get credit and it'll carry over to college for them? Yes, ma'am. In fact, if we are able to add on the additional course yes. to this, a 12th grade course called AP Capstone, the students could actually graduate with an AP diploma from the School oh. District of Waukesha. Um, right now, as it stands for our students that take AP Spanish 5 as freshmen, AP Spanish 6 as sophomores, um, I believe Carol will accept about 16 college credits, which is an entire semester for those students. If they continue on with this AP seminar and go on to a capstone, that could create much more impetus. And I think for us, the fact that we're holding it multilingually also um, 
validates um, specific world language credit for those students. So we'll see what happens. Will the class be taught in Spanish? Yes. Totally. No, we're thinking that the instructional framework of the class might be um, three weeks of study okay. in Spanish, and then we implement something called a bridge, and a bridge would be putting um, Spanish language and concepts up against English language so that the content transfers through the language, and kids don't need to learn it twice. They've already learned it. They just need sure. the language. Sure. Um, for something like MLA um, citation and things like that, we'll have to adjust it because that's not the same way that you'd cite in Spanish as you would in English. And so um, we'll have cultural comparisons where students are learning how language is used differently mm -hmm. depending upon the culture where it right. is derived from. So once we do that, then students will be able to transfer their learning, obviously, and produce. Just one more comment. Did I read correctly when it said um, we're going to go beyond um, Spanish and French? We're going to go into um, other languages and the cultures um, associated with that. Um, not necessarily with this class. This class will not go into other languages okay. per se, okay. but the nature of the course um, being that it's um, centered around inquiry will definitely um, challenge students to investigate issues of global multicultural uh -huh, concern, uh -huh, right. which may include the investigation of war, globalization. We're just not sure yet what those themes might be, and like I said, wanted to wait until the teachers were trained to make those decisions. Gee, this was very, very well developed. Uh, yes, is there um, a question or comment? The college boards have to approve? Yes. Okay, and when does that happen? Um, sometime at the end of 2018. We'll submit the syllabus to them probably by October, and then maybe by latest January 2019 we'll hear from them. Okay. So, and we need to be prepared in the event that they decide that they um, are not wanting to accept a course like this, and if that's the case, we'll just continue to move on, and if we require to change the name, we'll do that too. Um, so, I mean, the question I have is, is it's going to be approved after it starts, mm -hmm. and we're talking about knocking out academic options for what, Spanish? Yes. So the children or the students that take this course in September, if it doesn't get approved, they're going to lose their academic options for that. Mm -hmm. There are so few students, though, that can access youth options just due to the challenge of transportation. And I'll just say it, the challenge of being on um, a college campus when you're 15 and 16, that um, I do believe the majority would take this class and leave their youth options for senior year, which is what they typically do. I don't have any 11th graders now that are in youth options. They're all you don't have any 11th graders? How many 12th graders Not any in world language. Have? I'm sorry? How many 12th graders do we have? Um, in youth options, there's about eight of them. Is there eight? In Spanish, yeah. In and Spanish. they're in like high level <laughs> phonetics, um, medical translation interpretation, all those types of like very high level and technical um, courses out in our universities. Okay, and will this course just be strictly for 11th graders? You wouldn't be able to take this as a senior? Yes, yeah, so you can take it as a senior. Okay. Um, what you have to have completed is the entire course sequence. So you needed to have taken the Spanish five language, the Spanish six literature AP courses, because the desire here is to arm our students with as much college level work as possible in our school district so that they can take credits, which is a saving to families, et cetera. Um, and more than anything, to hear the, the message of their academic abilities. So um, it's not only for 11th graders, but we do want students to have completed that two set series before they take the AP seminar. Okay, and how many students do you think will be prepared to take this next year? About 75. 75 students. Mm -hmm. wow. so, and they will be 11th graders? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many seniors do you think would be willing, it would be available to take this course? It's hard next to year? say because um, I don't have those numbers exactly for you, but I can tell you that last year's Spanish 5 class was overwhelmingly freshmen. Okay. And only those kids that were in Spanish 5 are now in this AP 6 class. So I would say that probably 90% of our AP 6 kids in 10th grade are 10th graders. Okay. So we could certainly pick up kids that would want to take this course that hadn't yet been in it, but that's unlikely. I think if a child did want to go into this, um, I, the study at that level, if they were seniors, if they chose this, say, over Spanish 6, I think we would deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. So you don't think there's a lot of seniors that opted not to do the youth options because they couldn't get to the thing that may pop into this course? Um, yes. Okay. For sure. For sure. For there sure. There will be some 12th yes. graders that decide. There likely will be 12th graders that could not do youth options for sure. 
And we don't have any idea about how many were eligible to take youth options that did not? I do know that number, but I don't have it on the tip of my... I do okay. know it. I, there was something like 16 kids that we wanted to do it. Um, and some kids did sign up and then realize they couldn't afford the $300 textbook or, you know, there are other barriers. Mm -hmm. So it's not a perfect system for the students. Right. It's an opportunity, but it can be costly. Okay. Um, and then how are we sp spreading the information about this course? Because um, some of those struggles with those students is actually accessing the information that the course is out there. Yeah, so we've Especially had... parents who mm -hmm. may not, you know... Sure. So initially what we've had are two information sessions with um, our school counselors, our 6th through 8th, 12th um, um, grade school counselors, and so they are aware of what the path is for dual language learners, and that's the first step. A lot of the times the counselors are the ones that either make something aware to a student or don't, depending upon their orientation towards it. Um, in light of not having had the opportunity to speak with you all, I have not done a lot of publicity to parents directly about this course. I didn't think that that would be fair at this point. Um, and then pending your support for the course, of course, that will pick up. We want to be really timely because course selection happens in January. So um, I can tell you that the teachers that are currently teaching these students who would be eligible for this course um, would probably be the messenger directly to the students. Of course, we would send mailings and probably have a family information session for parents if that's what they would like. Um, but little by little, it'll drip out. This is an elective, right? Well, technically, yes. it's an elective. Yes. However, if you're a dual language student, this is your core curriculum. Okay. This is your core Spanish language arts curriculum. But technically, yes. it is seen as an elective. Okay. Okay. So, yes, it does compete with band. It does compete with choir, mm -hmm. any other choices students would have. Mr. Baumgard. This is an action item. Yes. And I've heard lots of good support for it, so I'm going to move for approval of the AP Dual Language Seminar course as presented by Dee. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Reinecek. Uh Any questions, further discussion? Well, I'd just like to tell you, Dee, you come back and I share will. with us, you know, and bring some of the students along, and um, uh, we'd be re really excited to hear how this is going next year, okay? Sure. What I like to do in the spring is come back and actually review um, resource selection with you yes. so that you're aware of what the themes yes. are yes. and the, um, the potential articles and or text that we might need. Job well done. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor, respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, 5-0. Stacy. thank you, Dee. Thank, thank you, you very much. Have a good night. Wow. <laughs> That doesn't happen often. <laughs> for you. <laughs> okay, our next item for action items is approval of the 2017-2018 overnight field trips. And I believe there's a handout um, that we received before the meeting tonight that has um, a list of uh, some new uh, trips that weren't included in your packet. There's a wrestling trip to, to um, Merrill and an FBLA to La Crosse, and then the West High School wants to go to Nationals at Baltimore FBLA. So um, Stacy has assured me that uh, <laughs> every item on these on these uh, field trip requests um, is in uh, is is complete. So we have that those, and then the the other ones uh, that were included in our packet, which very quickly is uh, let's see. Um, North, 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 oh, I'm busy. North, west, north. So, okay, could we, uh, could um, you have any questions first uh, of all? I think I got it cleared up, but I think we should just make a note that the uh, Baltimore trip is a competitive result of comp right. competing to that point. Right, and so. Uh, thank you. Does that not uh, have uh, district financial support? Yeah, yes, that's what I thought. Okay. okay, any any further questions or comments? Okay, could we have a motion then to accept the field trips as presented? So moved. Okay, is there a second, please? Second. Moved and seconded to um, accept the application for overnight field trips. Uh, any further questions, comments? Okay, all those in favor, respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye, zero, Stacy. Okay, our next um, item is an information item related to middle school physical education program update. Jody, would you take us into that, please? 
Yep, I'm just going to introduce uh, Wendy Schwengel, guys, and uh, she's probably going to give you the whole update. I see Dan's joining her probably for moral support. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no moral support. Um, no, thank you, thank you for having the two of us up here, and I'll turn it over to Wendy here in just a second to walk you through um, the handouts that you have. But I just want to share a little backstory that this has been a conversation that we we've had um, as Wendy will share with teachers and then again with middle school principals as an option to both address some barriers around access and scheduling as well as open up opportunities for students and we and what you'll hear tonight is a uh, proposal that will hopefully address both of those options increase opportunities for students um, while also in increasing the flexibility for students to access other elective options through the through the shifts that we'll be making here in physical education. So with that, I'll turn it over to Wendy. Dan. Hi. Um, the first sheet has some information. It's just a diagram of the traditional setup that we have currently for middle, middle school physical education. Um, they have their sixth grade year, and then come seventh and eighth grade, they have their seventh grade FIAD and eighth grade FIAD. And at some buildings, they have a little bit of a limited opportunity for kind of daily FIAD. Mostly that's used now as kind of helping balance the schedule, but everything is very cut and dry. Seventh graders take seventh grade FIAD, eighth grade take eighth grade FIAD. And some of the problems that we can alleviate by making a couple switches. Um, Wendy? Yes. I just asked Barb. I can interrupt. I'd like to have a little bit of, of idea of what goes on in the seventh grade and what goes on in the eighth grade FIAD because you're going to you're going to open the world when you get to the next page, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, okay. So the seventh grade the seventh grade FIAD and the eighth grade FIAD predominantly cover a lot of your typical sports specific and lifetime skills. Um, they're individual and dual sports. It's team sports. It's kind of um, a sampling of a lot of the different areas in physical education, and when with the, the plan that we have in place, what we would be doing is putting together a 7-8 physical education experience that would offer two sets of, um, I guess, curriculum. You would have an odd year and an even year. So now instead of a building having, for example, seventh grade physical physical education running first and second hour, and that's when it's run, and eighth grade might be third and fourth hour, that's trapping some of the students with some of the other potential electives that they can take uh, because they might be scheduled up against um, a physical education class, which is a DPI requirement. So by going into the seventh, eighth grade combined class, now we are going to have the potential for, in, in the previous example where I said, you know, first and second hour and third and fourth, by doing the seven, eight split, now you'd be opening up first hour, second hour, third hour, and fourth hour, and you'd be able to, to schedule the students in in those types of situations. By doing that, you are opening up the amount of options that the student has to choose for their other electives. So there are other electives now that maybe there's an elective that's only running third hour and another one that's only running fourth. Well, that would thereby pretty much take those students out of taking that particular elective. By doing um, this new system, those students would now have four potential slots they could fill in to meet their DPI requirement for physical education, thereby opening them up to fit in more of the electives of their choice um, and getting more of the courses that they want in, um, you know, in their priority system for themselves. The other thing that that would also do would be um, well, it would give them the, the more opportunity, but in addition to that, what we'd like to do is to also craft another type of an elective course that would also be running on a seven, eight, odd year, even year um, curriculum. And it would be based more around like wellness education, healthy lifestyles. It would be crafted in a manner in which it would meet the DPI requirements for their physical education. So the course could function as a requirement or it could also function as an elective because this course would be um, more based on healthy lifestyles and kind of, if you remember back to when we did the switch at the high school for 
the um, freshmen, this would have a little bit of a different flavor to how physical education would be being taught with a focus more on lifetime wellness and um, tying in more of the health concepts. So that course was um, actually initially brought up by a couple of our FIA teachers at the middle school, at a couple of the different middle schools that were noticing from student feedback the desire to have more of an approach to the wellness um, that could be due in part to the middle, the high school changes that, you know, the, the word was trickling down. But um, we have teachers on board fully that want to craft this course. And that would then take us to page three of the handout. And what that would do, it, was, it would add additional pathways for students because now going into seventh grade, they could have the choice of taking, I'll call it traditional physical education, so the regular 7-8 physical education, or they could take the 7-8 wellness physical education class, or they could do both. So one would, add, uh, one would function as their required physical education via the DPI, and the other would function is, as an elective. Um, this would also carry over into eighth grade since it's the odd year even year that the students could then take their seventh eighth grade physical education experience either as the seven eight FIAD odd year offering or the seven eight wellness odd year offering and again it could function in either capacity so a student could go in and go straight across the board seven eight PE as a seventh grader seven eight PE as an eighth grader they could do the wellness as a seventh, wellness as an eighth, or any combination of um, those courses. So it would meet the needs of some of the students who might enjoy a different approach to physical education, and it would also hopefully help um, the administrators with their scheduling so the students get more of the electives that they would like to be able to take while still meeting the DPI requirements. Will that uh, new course, um be, in, uh, be available at the high school level? The, the new course, wellness is, the wellness course. class, this, yeah. is, this is going to be crafted for the middle school. Yes. It's going to follow more along the, the philosophical approach of the way we did that with the, um, the two pathways for the freshmen where they could go either way. So it's kind of going to be the middle school mimicking of that. Okay. Um, we're going to be in crafting that with some of the middle school teachers who have some real good ideas in place. Barbara's question, in part of your answer, and you brought it up before, uh, the fact that what we did last year in the, in the high schools yes. has had an influence on doing this in the middle schools. Yes. Have we found those to be successful in the high school? I guess I haven't really had much feedback on that. Right, we just, we're kind of just getting it started, but so far the feedback has been, um, it's been positive. We've had, um, I've taken a look at the, the course selections at the high schools and some went 50-50, like half the freshmen took one a path and the other half took the other option. And at other buildings, you know, it's 70-30 or 30-70, so it was all over the, all over the board, but so far the feedback that we've been getting has been positive because they've enjoyed having a different kind of spin to it or at least having the option to have that available to them. Great, thank you. And the other thing I'd like to say, that, and the reason I asked at the beginning about the, the basic classes, the way we do mm -hmm. it yes. today, uh, I appreciate you giving us an answer on that because that helped me understand this makes so much more sense. You wonder why it took us so far. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't we get here a long time ago? Because it, it's, as I said, you opened up so many more opportunities for our kids to yes. be able to do things, not just in Phi Ed, but in other electives that might be blocked up. And I, I really appreciate the thought that you put into getting this moving. So thank, thank you. you. It's a team effort, though. Well, I didn't mean you personally. That was plural. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's great that you're adding um, a wellness course. I mean, I realize that it's... Um, it won't be required, but it, mm -hmm. it's an excellent course. There's so much being said and done with wellness today that uh, it's great to get our kids going when they're young. Yes, it is. And PE is required at the at middle school? Yes. And this would be an option. So a student could take this as they're required. Yes. They would have two oh. options. Oh, really? So yes. they could take one or the other. And so really? the sheets that you have are kind of different tracks or pathways, uh -huh. as Wendy talked about, that a student in seventh or eighth grade could take. They could go stay in the traditional PE track, they could do wellness for both years, or they could mix it up. 
The wellness class will be crafted to meet the DPI requirements of the weekly physical education, so you'd still be able to meet the okay. requirements, and so, so it could function in both roles. Do kids in middle school have to take VIAD every year? Yes. Yes, okay. And in As high per school, the DPI. In high school, two years? 1.5 credits spread over three years. All right. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um. We'll be bringing back the wellness PE course to yeah, you I'll next month. I'll be interested month. in seeing that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that with us this evening. Okay. Very you. interesting. It'll be good for our kids. Thank you. All right, our next um, information item is middle school global education course. Take us into that, please. Oh, D is so busy. <laughs> Bring it up or should, yep. Good evening. I just say it's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to Maria Barreras, who is the uh, multilingual coordinator for the school district. And she and her team will be presenting the course, and I am here for soft fuzzies and moral support. <laughs> okay, would you introduce? Um, we'll yes. introduce our other wonderful teacher. Hi, good evening. My name is Jennifer Yord. I'm, um, I teach at STEM Saratoga, the um, Spanish and World Cultures classes. Okay. And I'm Katie Dreffs. I teach French at Les Paul Central. Okay. Thank you. Take it away. Well, we're up and running. Good evening. Thank you for having us here. And we'd like to introduce a new course that we're working very hard in, in, uh, in developing and hope to get your approval tonight. The name of the course, it's called Global Perspectives. Um, the purpose of this course is to give students the opportunity to uh, interact and engage with global issues. This course is, uh, will be available to our middle school students, uh, sixth through eighth. It'll also be a semester long course. Um, uh, the course description is uh, that we will have the opportunity for students to learn and explore about world cultures. We have four pillars that we're going to engage uh, with uh, through this course. One of them is to investigate global issues, communicate different perspectives, and identify possible solutions. And the most important, and I think that the most, is the taking action part. So it's not just looking at global issues, but also uh, uh, solve, um, proposing solutions and being able to, to engage with their community by taking action. Um, so our essential questions for this course uh, are, how can, uh, how can looking at global issues through multiple perspectives impact solutions? And what understandings do we need in order to effectively communicate with a diverse audience? Uh, this, uh, these essential questions will ultimately lead to our enduring understanding that we want all our students to develop and uh, obviously to have when they graduate from Waukesha is to be able to understand, uh, you know, different uh, multiple perspective and communicate with a diverse, diverse audience and also to understand that culture definitely has an impact on how we, how we engage with our community uh, and with global issues. So we're, we're hoping that our students start in the middle school and start to develop those skills that is going to take them to, to high school and ultimately is going to help them uh, achieve that, um, the Global Education and Achievement Certificate, which right now currently offer to our high school seniors. Um, the course objectives are that students will analyze multiple perspectives and opposing views on social issues. We want students will investigate local and regional and global issues util utilizing multiple uh, resources. Uh, students will, have, uh, will be able to communicate with a diverse audience and uh, will recognize the need to develop and take action on those uh, you know, investigations that they do and, and provide possible solutions to some of those issues that they encounter, and whether it's community, regional, or global issues. Is this course um, a social studies course, or what would you, how would you relate it to current so, curriculum? So this course would be under the umbrella of the, of the world language course, but it's not language specific. Yes. It's not going to be a language course. It's going to be more of investigating okay. global issues. All right, so it's a world language, thank you. Yes. 
Uh, and then, of course, we're going to continue to develop the skills of inquiry-based learning, inquiry-based learning that we already do in the elementary setting uh, through the following, through Quest, which is uh, questioning, understanding, evaluating, and synthesizing, and definitely teaming, which are all skills that we want and hope our students to be able to have uh, as they graduate uh, from our school district. And it's going to have an aspect of personalized because we're going to offer students the opportunity to, to self-select uh, some of the uh, issues that they want to study. We are going to provide students with the themes that we want that we're going to develop our curriculum around. Uh, some of those themes that we already identified were political and social issues. You know, if you look at that as a, as a theme, and then another one, commerce and environment. For example, what impact or how do they intersect? Uh, how are consu consuming products in impact our environment, whether it's locally or globally? So those are some of the examples of uh, themes that we hope to be able to develop in this course. Uh, and obviously give students the opportunity to self-select within those themes their, you know, their choice in terms of what they want to uh, study and learn about and investigate and find solutions for. So our theory of action for this course is uh, if we give uh, all middle school learners the opportunity to investigate the world, to learn to communicate across uh, cultural, uh, culturally, examine their own and others' perspectives, and take action around global issues, then we will graduate students that demonstrate global competency and meet the 21st century standard. And of course, those are skills that we that pair very nicely with our GIAC award, which our students right now have the opportunity to receive by um, their senior year. So this is a pathway for our middle school students to start to develop those skills that's going to take them to ultimately get that certificate. So that was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> any I know. Any questions? Well, I thought maybe the other two were going to present oh. something. So. No, they're just here for you know these wonderful here for teachers. support to you. Yeah, huh? we've okay. you know we've been working on you know starting you know to develop sure. this course sure. and we're we're you know we're going to continue and we hope that you approve this course because so we can develop it to its completion. Mr. Baumgart has a question. Uh, yes, I just want to make sure that I, I had a question. I think you answered it. Mm -hmm. You do not have to be taking a language to take this course, correct? Oh. No, so it's not. A purely English-speaking child could be taking it for, to learn about the, per, the, the cultures and the, okay. Yes. That's great because that's what I was wondering about that because yes. I see so much value in what, what you're bringing forward here. The other point that I was curious about, I know that at least two of our elementary schools, Banting and Rose Glen, have d brought in some, some level of international awareness of other countries and so on and so forth. This is not competitive with that. I assume this is grow, going to help grow on that, correct? Yes, because if you think there's kids already doing that, you know, they're doing that inquiry base in elementary, and we're continuing to develop the skill into middle school. So we're just going to continue to give them more opportunities to engage with their world and be able to think about it and analyze and, you know, find solutions for issues that we, we encounter in our everyday lives. And thirdly, yes, <laughs> we're not going to let... <laughs> you guys off the hook. Uh, yeah. I know, Jennifer, you're doing some of this work at STEM, and maybe you could share with us a little bit about how it's working there. Sure. Um, I will preface this by saying this is my first year at STEM, so I'm, I'm new to this class and teaching. Um, but I will tell you, like, what we are currently doing, um, my class is themed um, currently around looking at global con conflicts. Um, so I'm bringing in a lot of current events. Um, for example, we recently looked at um, countries that are uh, a part of a region of the country as seeking independence. So using the, the current events that are happening in Catalonia, Spain as a um, kind of case study for the students to look at. And then they chose their own inquiry based project to look at a historical or current um, push for independence in a part of the world. So giving them the chance to look at what are the cultural, political, and economic factors that might lead um, a region of a country to seek independence, and then present it back on that. So um, it gives students the opportunity to really research and investigate um, any part of the world that might be of interest to them. 
giving, letting them look at um, historical events or current events. Um, and so I think that that kind of reaches beyond the scope of some of the language classes that are really tied to specific regions. Um, it's allowing them to really explore the world um, that might be tied to their heritage or to their just interests or passions. Thank you. Welcome. Any other comments or questions? I have a silly question. Uh, under uh, literature and instructional best practices down at the bottom, you talk about flipped lessons, and I'm not so sure what a flipped lesson is. So could you explain that? That's when they, they would, instead of doing like homework of like answering questions about yes. something, they might watch a video or do some of their research, you know, at home. And then in class, there's more collaboration with other students or asking questions to the teacher rather than the teacher being the one to give them the information. Okay, thank you very much. All right, now this class will be an elective, is that right? Yes, okay. this will be an elective semester long course. Okay, and it's really considered world language. It isn't history or? Yes, it social. will be under the umbrella of the world language. Okay, very good. How did it come about that you decided to develop this course? Has there been interest shown? Or are you interested in you know, taking the students beyond what we currently do? I think we wanted to give students some options to engage sure. with, their, with global issues. Uh, uh, separate from just language. We know that if we expose students to multiple uh, cultures and in the world at large, right. that might in, in entice them or open up the want to learn that language. So trying to give them some more entries into being interested in, in world languages. And is this going to be offered at all schools? Yes. It will. Okay. Very good. Anything else? Well, it certainly sounds interesting, especially because we're going to have kids who graduate that are knowledgeable about what's going on in the world. And yes, we need more. We need more people to be yes. knowledgeable about that. Very good. All right. I guess any more questions, comments? I just want to clarify. So our our um, cycle of uh, action around these courses is that we bring it to the board for a first reading. Yes. You can see our pattern, right? right? First yes. reading yes. for information. Get the question and answers uh, feedback to the team. Then we'll come back next month yes. for final approval. Right. Okay. Right. So we'll see you next month. We'll see you next month. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you so much. Sounds great to me. Okay. Um, student achievement update. The nest has been restless. The higher hawks <laughs> are flying out of the nest. Mark, would you be so kind as to come up here and introduce yourself and the team. Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks for having us. Excited about this. Well, welcome, all of you, each and every one of you. Nice words. I'll say some nice okay. words. Okay. <laughs> Hire is in the house. They're here to tell their achievement story, and I'm pleased to say that I get to coach Mark Schneider, the principal, and I will let him go ahead and introduce his partners here and start the story. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight and having us um, with me tonight are uh, the effectiveness coach at Hire and Blair, um, Jamie Martinson, as well as the uh, ESL teacher leader at Hire, um, Carly Hurdle. So again, thanks for having us this evening to uh, talk about Hire and, and the great growth and achievement that we've had. Um, our student population is, represents a unique challenge, um, but it's a tremendous opportunity for um, for success, so uh, our mission of Hire is, uh, is a community is committed to providing a safe and nurturing environment that develops self-motivated thinkers for our global community. You see our hashtags there, vamos higher, go higher, um, playing on our words of always reaching higher for success. Um, some of our key demographics, 56% of our students are Latino, 35% of our students are white, 15% are identified with disabilities, 60% of our students are economically disadvantaged. 44% of our students are identified as ELL or English language learners. Um, but 100% of our students are capable of academic success and that's something that we all believe. Um, highlighting some of the growth and achievement that we've seen. Um, this is as demonstrated by our MAP assessment. 
Uh, so this is the percentage of overall growth target achieved from spring to spring. Um, our goal is, is to maintain and exceed 100% growth target. Um, that would mean that students that test in the spring, they have a specific target to reach in the spring. And if collectively as a whole, we reach that target, that would be 100%. So you can see the, the gradual growth starting in 2012 um, all the way through 2016-17, where last school year we achieved 104% of growth, of our growth target overall. That means our students are not only reaching their goals, they're exceeding them and they're closing gaps, which is a huge goal of ours. Um, within math, you can see that the gradual growth, um, we, we experienced the hiccup there in 2015-16, um, which made us really rethink our math instruction and rethink what we're doing to make sure that we're focused on success for kids and, and we saw the success um, and growth last school year. Um, definitely highlighting our growth of our ELL students. This is measured by our forward exam. Um, in 2015-16 in ELA, um, there's a lot of red there. We have 75% of our students were assessed at below basic, um, which is, which, uh, is very, very poor. So last year we, we, we looked and we thought how we need to instruct and how we need to focus our resources and make sure that our students are growing. Um, and we reduced that number of scoring below basic by 20%. Um, and you can see there's more yellow and, and even some green at the top there. Um, and then also within our math success on, on the forward exam, um, in 2015-16, 73% scored below basic. Um, last year, it's 49%, so definitely um, closing those gaps. And this is our ELL students at, at higher. Question um, mark. Third through fifth grade. Yes, sir. And, and both of those, is this all levels in your school? There? Third through uh, fifth grade. Combined? Yes, combined third through fifth grade performance on That's the right. okay, third forward and, exam. Third and fifth? Third, fourth, and fifth. Okay, third through fifth. Yes, sir. Thank you. So definitely closing those gaps and, and seeing that our need, where our needs are and, and focusing instruction and resources to make sure it's success. Um, starting in the younger grades, this is uh, highlighting some of our growth as measured by the PALS Espanol or Spanish assessment. So you can see coming in the fall um, of 2016-17, 74% of our students were, were, did not meet the benchmark entering as a kindergarten student. Um, by the end of that school year, we experienced 67% at or above the benchmark. In first grade of last school year, we had 74% performing at or above, above benchmark in fall. And then in spring, we see 94% are at or above benchmark. And this is, this is Spanish. So this is inclusive of our um, kindergarten and first grade students. This, in, at, at higher, our kindergarten through second grade is two-way dual language, which means it's native Spanish and native English speakers. So this is inclusive of both native Spanish and native English. Um, in third through fifth grade at higher, we're one way, which means it's all Spanish language, um, native Spanish speakers or English language learners. Um, a key um, attribute of our success has been our, um, our success in reducing referrals for be behaviors. Um, from 2015-16 to the 2016-17 school year, we uh, realized a 20% decrease in referrals for major or minor behaviors. Um, for the first nine weeks of this school year, we've, re we've seen a 65% uh, reduction in referrals, and that's what this graph refers to here. Um, we track the behavioral data and the weekly referrals, and currently we have seen a reduction of 65% of referral for behavioral concerns um, in the building. So definitely a huge, huge plus and, and highlight of, of what we're seeing. Um, we believe the growth and achievement that we've seen at higher is, is definitely due to improved school climate as measured by our behavior, as measured by um, our success in the classroom and the focus on learning first and making sure that that's the priority. Um, definitely a narrow focus on high leverage instructional strategies instead of kind of throwing Throwing, thing, throwing a dart and hoping it lands, we are pinpointing, we're, we're hitting that bullseye. We're focused on specific strategies, high-level strategies that we know are going to impact learning, and we're not, we're not throwing five darts, we're throwing two or three darts, focusing and narrowing, so we're making sure that we're, we're doing, being successful with those. Um, with our teachers, we're even flexible with our PD, and we're differentiating learning for teachers. We know that each teacher needs something different. So we're making sure that we're focusing on their needs, just as we would with students. We want to make sure that the teachers are learning and getting what they need. Um, we've definitely shored up our student social and emotional growth. We've made sure that our tier one or our, our baseline universal instruction 
for how our kids learn how to behave, how to act, how to treat each other, that everybody gets the same, same um, instruction. And then we're also ensuring the equity and allocation of resources, which is a huge piece of our, our program, making sure that the students who need the help most receive that help so that they can be successful um, and ensuring equity across the, the school. Um, and those are the highlights that we have here, some pictures of some, some lovely higher hawks in our, our beautiful school, school community. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Well, I'd like, I'd like to congratulate you on the progress that you've made over there at, at higher school. It's so important when we see um, from year to year student um, whatever, pro make progress, great progress in whatever goals that you have set for them. And when you get into school culture and explaining what it, what it is at your school, that's what you like to see in the school. So I think you're to be complimented on that. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Mr. You Brown. can't let them sit here. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess quite simply with <laughs> I know you have questions for him, Bill. Jamie, shame on you. <laughs> uh, what do you see as why higher is improving or how it's improving or what are you contributing or something along, whatever you want to share, <laughs> both of you. <laughs> is on? Okay. Um, I would say just the more structured, we really focused on our professional development and really um, kind of what Mark said, really narrowing our focus. So this year we're really working on our guided groups and really having a structured focus with our PLCs, which is professional learning communities. So they meet with their grade levels and really we're, we're trying to relaunch that because we found that in the past that our teachers are coming from different levels and some have done PLCs in the past and some haven't. Um, so we're restructuring those and really looking closely at our student data and how our students um, can grow and um, see growth in all those areas. I think another area that's really helped us a lot is that Flex PD. So that's an opportunity for them to get professional development during the day while our students are still getting academic learning within the classroom. So we structured it that way. Um, and now our goal really is, like Mark mentioned, that all the teachers are coming at different levels just like our students are and how can we best meet their needs. So um, it's been great that Carly has joined our team and so we've been able to um, differentiate that PD so I can lead one and she can lead the other. So I think just really having a lot of structures in place, I think um, from year to year our, our leadership team has stayed together and are really working together and especially our SAIL team as well and starting to have the same members and working as a team to have higher growth. Great. Carly? Well, I am just joining higher this year in the school district of Waukesha. So um, I've been here since September, but I'm really impressed with um, the fact that we do put students first. They're, we're very student-centered when we look at data and teacher learning. And then, the, like Jamie was mentioning, um, the support provided to teachers so that they can grow in um, their profession and better help our students. So um, being the ESL um, teacher leader, I really enjoy the fact that we do put a lot of um, professional development on the growth and closing gaps of our ESL students. Well, I thank you and welcome. <laughs> Mark, aren't you proud of those people? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm proud of the whole team. It's, 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 been, a, it's been a great few years that oh, we've been able to have consistency and, and really grow. Jamie, you made an interesting point that I don't know if we've ever thought about, was the teachers go from building to building, the possible inconsistency in the, uh, the PLC that they've had. Do we watch that? Do we... <laughs> Well, what I'm saying, she brought up an interesting point. We also have a lot of new teachers, too. So, so I think in the past, we're used to, like, I've been in Waukesha. This is my 12th year now. So we did PLCs 12 years ago. But every school did a little bit different. The structures were different. And so we just felt like everyone was at a different level with that. So we just needed to read. Well, I think, and that's, I think that's an important point for all of our schools that you don't want teachers at all different levels in your school, so you need to somehow bring some uniformity to it, right? Valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clear, consistent expectations for, for how we learn and work together. Thank you. Mark, how many of your teachers do travel? Uh, we, we, have very, we don't have any teachers that travel, actually. Really? Yeah. What about 
the coaches. Coaches, we <laughs> yeah, we, we share Jamie with with Blair. She's fifty percent higher, fifty percent Blair, okay. which also means we um, we have Anne Marie, who's the math instructional coach, uh -huh. who uh, is fifty percent Blair, fifty percent higher. So, well, I just have to say personally that the support that we provide to teachers and students today is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You know, I taught for a long time and didn't have any of those people to refer to. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah, the, the coaching that that's oh. both Carly and Jamie and Anne Marie provide for our teachers is invaluable. It's it is. It is. And so, therefore, it shows with your progress that Absolutely. that support is so important. So I'm glad to hear that. Yes, Mr. Dietz. Mark, with your um, growth and, and um, results for MAP testing, do you involve students in any shape or form with those growth targets? Absolutely, yeah. Our students are. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, our students do a lot of goal setting. Um, when they every time they take the map assessment, it gives them specific goals or focus areas that they need to work on. It also gives a lot of data to the teacher that they can help have conversations with the student of, of their progress, um, and they, it's measured over time. So students are able to to take the assessment and and realize their gains or make adjustments. And you know they're a big part of that piece. Um, we've also implemented uh, Epiphany Learning, which helps to. Um, implement some more student goal setting where students have an interface that they're able to document their goals and chart their progress over time and have conversations not only with their peers but their teachers and their um, parents. It's really powerful when you give some of the ownership back to the students. Oh, absolutely. Where it belongs. Absolutely. It's a key and they piece. start tracking and monitoring their growth, which is good. So I'm yes, glad sir. to hear that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Franchek. Thank you. Mark, do you have to, are you including the disabilities in with? the your counts yes that by law we have to do that right yes we do do that mm -hmm. um and those are more physical disabilities correct no no okay <laughs> no we, we have we have students with that are emotional behavioral physical disabilities but that 19 uh, they were 19 i believe 14 14 with disabilities. 14 percent okay yes yeah identified oh, percent okay yeah 14 percent that are identified with disabilities whether it be cognitive um special specific learning disabilities okay. ohi ebd Speech and language. Um, when my kids went to hire, they had those special rooms, and so in my mind, I was thinking mm -hmm. physical disabilities. Um, I was just asking Jody about your hiccup, and if that was before you came or while you, it that was, was my leadership. that was our first year. That okay. was our first year, and and we realized uh, um, that we we really needed to make sure we had an emphasis on um, math instruction. We we've imp we've implemented uh, AVMR training, and um, staff have, have really bought into that. What that does is help to um, analyze what students' needs are in math, and you may be teaching a student um, some multiplication or division, but the AVMR helps to pinpoint what deficits they may have in their math learning. So if they are doing some multiplication or division, they may not have learned how to do double-digit addition, so that's what, what's holding them back. So having, to, having assessments that are able to diagnose those struggles and then getting resources to address those things is what AVMR does. And then when you said um, kids who need the help the most are receiving that help now, right. um, that's wonderful. And I think about the other percentage of the kids that would, um, okay, so my kids were at higher, now they're at STEM, and they can kind of go on their own. They can go at their own pace. They right. wouldn't be held back. What are you doing for those kids? Oh, we're, we're doing extension activities. Um, we have a lot of personalized pieces that are doing extension. We've This year we've um, implemented a um, technology coach or technology champion that, that works with teachers to develop extension projects um, within the classroom so that we, we have what's called the Idea Lab, which is our makerspace and exploratory place. Um, so they have specific times that their teachers work with the, the technology coordinator to implement projects within their classroom or to implement extension activities for those students who are you know, at or above grade level that need to explore and do some more inquiry projects. So in your math class with this AVMAR, is that how you say it? AVMR, yeah. Um, we just learned about that not too long ago. I'm glad that you're using it. Uh, are they able to, let's say they're in fourth grade, are they able to go to a sixth grade math if that's how far advanced they are? Are they able to just move on if there's mm -hmm. some that are? Oh, absolutely, yeah. With, with the workshop model that we have for math instruction, um, there's different groups that are formed based on specific uh, need okay. and, and progress. And if there's 
if you look into a given fourth grade classroom, you're going to see probably five, four to five different groups, and you're going to see students that are below grade level, that grade level that may need, you know, meetings with teachers three to four times per week, and then you may see those that are above grade level that are meeting with the teacher once, twice, and they have inquiry projects that they're they're doing separately and, and um, meeting their needs at, at specific math levels. Okay, thank you, and excellent work, all of you. Thank you. Do some of your students that are um, uh, high learners, high achievers, are, are, and then you have some that are not, do you put fifth graders into a fourth grade classroom because that's where their needs are? No, we, we differentiate within each individual classroom. Within, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good because you talked about the different groups, and I wondered, you know, does yeah. groups have uh, varying grade levels, varying ages? Okay, very good. Well, congratulations. It's, it's wonderful to know the things that are going on over at Hire. We needed to hear that, thank you. And, I, and I like that. So oh, thank you for having us. Thank you to each and every one of you for um, doing what you're doing at Hire to make all that uh, achievement possible. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of our meeting. Uh, our next uh, Teaching and Learning Committee meeting will be Tuesday, December 5th, 2017 at 6 o'clock in the boardroom. Meeting adjourned. Look at the time tonight. Wow.